In light of some of the recent corporate scandals uh, that have plagued the news lately, the issue of corporate governance has, uh, has been of, uh, of much interest. You teach a course here at Anderson in corporate governance. What are, what are some th key issues that you cover in that course? Well, first of all, I think it's important to distinguish between governance and management. Management involves the activities of directing a part of a business. Governance means setting the conditions within which others can manage effectively. Governance also refers to the oversight of the entire firm on behalf of the owners of the firm, that is, the shareholders. These days, it's very easy to be un, un forgivingly critical, in some cases that's appropriate, of the governance breakdowns at the top of some very big and notorious companies. And it's, we're inclined to want to say every member of the board of directors must be completely independent, and that's true by law, and it's true as a, as a good management practice, and that every member of the board of directors must be diligent and, and must be well informed about the business and that's obviously true as well. But one of the things I encourage my students to think about is how do you create those conditions. If you're in New York or Los Angeles, it's not too difficult to put together a board of directors of a 10 or 11 people who don't know each other, whose companies don't do business with the company on whose board they serve, and who can be fully independent. But if you're in Kansas City, if you're in St. Louis, if you're in San Diego, if you're in Detroit, those are relatively small business communities when you get to the top. And the people at the senior levels know each other. Chances are they do business together, or they have, or they will in the future. And now it's not so easy to find people who are fully independent in every way, and instead, you have to understand how you can construct the right kinds of safeguards, the right kinds of customs, habits, and practices that will bring about the kind of true independence and thinking only about the welfare of the shareholders that we need. Now, Doing that requires a very strong ability to understand the dynamics that take place when you have 10, 11, 12 people together frequently on a board of directors. Because the members of the board of directors, after all, are like you and me. They're human beings. And they have feelings and they have passions and they make mistakes. And above all else, having an effective board of directors means having an effective group of people who work together, each of them necessarily independent of the others, and yet at the same time, all of them working together as a team. Now, how do you get 11 senior, experienced, powerful people to do that, to work completely on their own, each engaging in completely independent decision-making debating all the issues and debating them sometimes in a very tough and a very intense way, yet having the ability to come together and work as a team. That's a very difficult thing to do. And as a result, there are many boards of directors that get into trouble because either people lose their ability to be independent of one another and of the management or because they lose their ability to work together as a team. Both of those are very, very serious shortcomings that can develop. The other thing that's important about a board is even though you may not serve on a board of directors for several years, the work that you do inside the company that you're employed by is going to be heavily affected by the decisions made by the board. And it's important for you, if you're going to be effective as a junior leader within the company, to understand the kinds of things that are important to a board, to understand the point of view of board members, to understand the dynamics of decision making on the board. And those are the kinds of things that we cover, hoping to prepare you 
so that you'll know that those issues are there, you'll think about them, and in time develop your own skill sufficiently that you can be a good board member too. Another topic that's uh, been in the news lately is, is CEO compensation. And in fact, Fortune Magazine and uh, CBS News have argued that CEO compensation is out of control. Both of these stories point to what they call a breakdown in corporate governance as a, as a sign or a cause, rather, of out-of-control compensation. Would, would you agree with this assessment? I would say that uh, dealing with CEO compensation is one of the most uh, publicized and politicized issues that we deal with today. And here I think a school of management like ours has a very important role to play. And that is that we need to be an independent voice. We need by our research, by our teaching, by our writing and our, and our speaking, to attempt not simply to mirror or to analyze what companies do, but rather to attempt to elevate the practice of management. And I think that there are many, many cases in which senior executives are not subjected to adequate scrutiny by boards of directors and it, which compensation has clearly gotten out of control. I say it's all too infrequent that faculties of our leading business schools have been willing to put their necks out on the line to speak up and to be heard in, in attempting to improve the practices of governance and of management, and that's what we ought to do.